This one is talking about working with your maps online and uh, specifically uh, offline and uh, with the ArcGIS runtime. Uh, unfortunately, my colleague Nick, who was meant to be here with me, he can't be here today, but he has recorded some videos, and uh, so we'll be playing these uh, for, the, for the demo sections. Okay, let's get, let's get started. The, the first thing we want to kind of get across to, to you is when you're thinking about building an application that works sort of online or offline, you've really got to factor the, that connectivity into the design of the app from the start. It's not something that you can bring to the application design later because there's a number of uh, uh, questions that you've got to ask yourself, get the answers to, and that will definitely impact your user experience that you're going to put in to your application. And so when the types of connectivity that we support, always connected, Maybe you're working in a facility that uh, your users are always connected on Wi-Fi and you can guarantee that uh, network connectivity. Or you know there is good uh, uh, mobile phone coverage in the environments that you're working on. Maybe you're always working completely disconnected with no connection to uh, servers or back-end services. And so that greatly impacts how you get data to your client as well as what the client can do once they are offline. <clears throat> you can be occasionally connected. This is probably the most common scenario that we see. And that occasional connection can be very deliberate. Maybe your field crews are connected in the office first thing in the morning and then they go out in the field in the afternoon uh, during the day and then they come back in the afternoon and get reconnected. Or maybe it's very ad hoc and uh, it's only when they get a Wi-Fi at a coffee shop or somewhere at random points through the day or at random points through the week or the month. And so think about, think about that. <clears throat> uh, temporary interruptions due to connection problems. So you think you're going to be connected all the time, but maybe there's moments during the day when you will become disconnected. How's your application going to, to cope with that? And uh, the kind of the rule of thumb is assume the worst in most of the uh, cases and assume that uh, some parts, sometime you will be disconnected uh, if you're building mobile applications and uh, make sure that your application can deal with that gracefully and, and doesn't, uh, doesn't crash or, or uh, cause your uh, uh, workers to basically stop working in the field. So it all really starts with uh, a map. And with uh, the runtime, uh, with our newer architecture that's now been out for two and a half years, uh, the map is really the central component of our object model. And uh, you can't really do a whole lot without working uh, with, with a map. And you can author these maps in a, in a number of ways. You can author these maps all in code. But increasingly, we're seeing them being authored in other parts of the ArcGIS platform, whether that's uh, ArcGIS Pro or whether it's the map viewer inside of, uh, uh, inside of ArcGIS Online or uh, your ArcGIS Enterprise. That's where the maps uh, get, get created. Uh, sometimes you can start in Pro and then publish to Online to get an online uh, version of, of, the, uh, of the map. The nice thing about using a map is that these maps can be consumed in multiple applications. So depending on the form factor, depending on the user experiences that you're uh, trying to achieve, you might decide to try and put everything you want into one large application, or you might decide to put things into smaller, more focused applications. If it's the latter, you only need to take the map offline once and all the applications can share that, can share that map. The updates uh, uh, to the map can be shared very, very easily. You don't need to write code in order to change symbology or to add a new layer into your, uh, uh, of data into your application. All that you need to do is update your map and then the next time your application connects and gets the, the latest map, there, everybody's application becomes uh, up to date. So maps contain operational layers which have symbology and pop-ups and uh, all the, the, the properties that you would expect from an operational layer. Maps contain base maps, vector or raster, 
and maps have some metadata uh, that uh, we use internally to uh, uh, to help facilitate some of the functionality in the API. And we'll be going into some of that later this morning. So the mapping workflows that we're really going to focus on this morning, the first one is uh, the simplest, the connected map uh, workflow. That assumes that you have your maps in online or within your enterprise uh, server, and your client connects to the map and just works with uh, the data coming from services. Very easy to uh, set up, very easy to build an application that uses it, but it does have the restriction that if you lose your network connectivity, your applications uh, uh, could potentially stop working. So for that, we've got these uh, other workflows, the disconnected map, completely disconnected, it's, uh, it's never been online to take offline. It's only existed <clears throat> on your desktop and you've packaged it up and you've s created a, a, a packet of, it, of data uh, and pushed it across, side-loaded it onto your mobile device. There's uh, two uh, workflows that we support if you are starting out online and that's the on-demand mapping workflow where the uh, client generates and downloads, generates a request for, a, for an area, the server prepares it, and then uh, it gets downloaded. And there's the pre-planned workflow where the server end has pre-staged various areas that can go offline, and then the client downloads these. And we'll be going into all of these in, in quite a bit of detail. Okay, so let's start with working with connected maps. <coughs> So this is a services pattern. So everything is backed by services. And so this, your data is sitting inside of ArcGIS Online or it's sitting inside of your ArcGIS Enterprise. And this pattern supports uh, editing, if you want. We had a session yesterday, I know a number of you were at it, where we sort of went deeper into what's possible when it comes to editing. But this, this workflow supports that. You have your web map. You can author a web map inside of Pro and publish to the server, or you can start online and you can uh, author your uh, web map online, or you can cr actually create a map uh, in code directly from within the runtime. So what's this, uh, this web map? Well, it's composed of a couple of uh, components. There's the actual item that, that exists in the portal information model. This is basically metadata about the web map. There's the map itself, and uh, the map points to layers and, and, and services. We can have tiled layers backed by a raster tiled service. We can have feature layers backed by feature services. We can have feature layers that are backed by another item type, this feature layer item type, which in turn is backed by a feature service. But that feature layer allows overrides on the feature service to be applied. And so the, these overrides flow through into the map. So you could, the feature service, as you all know, has symbology included within the service. But you can override that symbology and you can store it in the overrides of the feature layer, and then every time that feature layer is used, these overrides get picked up. And you can have vector tiled layers, which are backed by a vector tile service, and you can have a vector tile layer, which again is backed by an, an, in, uh, an item in ArcGIS Online, which allows overrides to be applied to the vector tiled service. And this is exactly what's happening when you create your own custom style for a vector tile service. What happens is the, the actual tiles of data, they stay the same, but your styling information what you, that you've created using the style editor gets stored in these uh, override uh, resources. <clears throat> okay, so let's have a look at uh, how you would go about authoring and using online maps. Okay, so here we are at my organization's homepage, and I'm just going to create a new map. I'm going to add some data to this map. Let's search for some layers. This so happens I've got some password implications can be in the top there. I just want to change the initial view of this map. I'm not very happy with that. 
full extent. Okay, so I've got my locations on the map. I want to do a couple of things here real quick. Um, first thing, I know there's a type field on here, so I want to symbolize these based on type. You can see now it's broken them down, it's analyzed the data behind it, and come up with uh, a classification. I also want to make these symbols just a little bit bigger so it's a little bit easier to see. That should do. Um, and one last thing, I'm going to change the base map from the topographic to something a little flatter. Okay, so now my location is stand up. And I save the symbology. Oh, we've got this map. So I'm going to save the map. <laughs> call it Palm Springs Locations. I'll give it a tag. And then for the sake of this demo, I'm going to share this publicly. Now that means in the uh, demo code, we're not going to have to worry about credentials and authentication. Okay, so now at the top here, you'll see this URL now has this ID on it. So once we saved it, it got this identifier. Um, we could also go ahead and look at the details page for this map. This you might be familiar with. And again, this ID is sitting at the top. So I'm going to copy this ID. I'm going to jump over to Xcode. So here I've got a project that's going to open this web map uh, in a map view. First thing I do is connect to the portal. In this case, I'm connecting to ArcGIS Online. Then I create a portal item using that portal as a reference, and here's where I paste in that ID. So between the portal and the ID, the runtime knows how to get hold of that web map. Then I'm just going to create a local map using that item and display it in the map view. So when I run this, we can see that web map displayed in the iPad, exactly as we configured it, the same base map, the same symbology defined. And as we zoom in and navigate, you can see those vector tiles working to give us all the high detail we expect from them. OK, thanks, Nick. All right, so there was the code that Nick uh, was showing there. The first thing that you do, you get a connection to your portal, online or enterprise. Just use the URL for that, and then <clears throat> You uh, access the individual item in the portal, and then you can uh, create a map, instantiate a map from that item, and then you bind that map to the map view. The map view is bound to one map at a time. If you want to, your application to work with multiple maps, you can do that by swapping out the map into the, in the map view, or you could have multiple map views in your, uh, in your user uh, interface uh, all uh, both looking at separate separate maps. Okay, so that was working with connected uh, maps. Very very straight, uh, very straightforward. Let's look at disconnected, and we'll start with the fully disconnected uh, 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 scenario. This is really a desktop to device workflow, and it's one way. The, these maps. Fully disconnected maps from ArcGIS Pro are read-only. You can't edit the content and then bring that edited content back in to desktop. So it's a read-only workflow. You create these mobile map packages in Pro. Uh, they can be very sophisticated in cartography. They can. We've actually got uh, uh, street map uh, premium uh, content available for runtime developers that you can use inside of your applications. And mobile map packages, they contain more than just a map. They contain potentially one or more locators, and they contain uh, network data sets as well, so they support routing. And it's these mobile map packages, for instance, that are backing Navigator, uh, which is an application from Esri to do uh, street turn-by-turn uh, -turn driving directions. It's using that network data set that's included and then you sideload it onto your uh, device using uh, some uh, workflow that, that you establish with, uh, with your users. Okay, so let's have a look at the mobile map package. So it has, again, it has a map. It actually can have more than one map inside of it. It can have any number of, of maps inside of a mobile map package. It has uh, item info with a little bit of metadata about that map. Uh, similar in, in concept to the item uh, uh, that exists in the portal API, it's got a little bit of metadata about the, about the map. And then it points to data. 
and it can point to tiled layers in the form of TPKs. It can point to feature layers in the, time, in, uh, the geodatabase. The geodatabase in this case has symbology information encoded into the feature classes. So a mobile geodatabase knows how to symbolize itself uh, with, the default, uh, with the default symbols. But again, you can override these at the feature layer level. It can also point to vector tiles, layers, and again, it can point to these uh, styled vector tile layers as well. So you can have multiple, uh, multiple styles pointing at the same raw vector tile sets. So it's very similar to some degree to, uh, to your web map, but it's all bundled up into one uh, file, an MMPK file. So this is the user uh, UI in, uh, in Pro to create it using the geoprocessing tool. Just, you'll find it in the uh, package tool set, which is in the data management toolbox. And you can see here, you can select multiple input layer, uh, input maps, and then depending if you, if you select multiple input maps, some of the properties in the form will change because you now need to, to, to specify a little bit more information about the areas of the map that you would like, or maps that you would like to uh, take offline. And you fill in the details and then you publish and it creates a simple uh, uh, file that you can then load onto your device. And we've got a demonstration here from Nick. So I want to take a quick look at generating mobile web packages. <laughs> You can do that in Pro. Um, you generate an MMPK file, you then have to save it onto your device. Here I've got a Pro project that has a couple of maps in it. It's all looking at the same data, just different views in the same project. And if I just want to export the current map as an MMPK, I can pick the map, I'll go to share and use the mobile map package tool. This is now going to create, you see it's a shared installment map, it's this map here as a mobile map package. I'm going to create an MMPK of just this map. I give it the location, specify a little bit of stuff about what I want included in here, how I want to clip the data. Maybe I've got a polygon layer that will define an area of interest for me. And I can package that. You can package with generate an MMPK. But MMPKs are mobile map packages, so they can include more than one map. And let's say I wanted to create one that had both the overview and the stormwater map in it. Well, in that case, I go to the GP tool, and I look for the Create Mobile Map Package tool. You can search for it. It just happens to be in my history here. So I'm going to fire this up. And when it shows up, we'll have a few options. This is very similar to the other tool, um, only now we get the opportunity to select from a number of different map definitions that we have to find in our project. Still specify the MMPK location. And there's a little more information here, since we've now got multiple maps in there. We can say, I want to export the data covered by the union of those map areas. And then I'll just go ahead and run that. That generates one MMPK with multiple maps, but just one set of data that all those maps make use of. So let's take a single map MMPK and look at what that looks like on an iPad. So here I've got Dropbox with an MMPK, and I've written a runtime application that knows how to open MMPKs. I'm going to tell Dropbox to just open it in that application. And that MMPK is now opened up by runtime. I can zoom in. We see all the feature details. We've got the base maps. We can navigate around. It's all drawn directly on the device. So let's take a look at the code required to open that. It's really very simple. When iOS called in from Dropbox to say I've got this, URL, this file with this URL, here's that URL. I go ahead and create a mobile map package from that URL. I load that mobile map package to understand what's contained within it in terms of the maps. And I get the first map out of it, and I just apply it to the app's map view. That's all it takes to display that map from the mobile map package in the map view of the iPad and make it fully interactive. OK, so the, <clears throat> the runtime does support the same cartographic information model that Pro does, but it has two, it's got a separate implementation of that. Uh, and so it is possible you may 
see a difference in the symbology between pro and runtime. But if you see that, the way that we treat it, it's, more, it's a bug that we need to fix. So the expectation that you should have as users is if you've authored your map in pro, it should look like that when you open it up inside of runtime. And <clears throat> there, there's a little bit of work that the team's still doing to upgrade some of its uh, uh, graphics rendering and handling of arcade scripts. But uh, with the upcoming release in uh, just a couple of weeks time, with update five of runtime, they've really closed that gap. And so the, the rule of thumb is it should be the same. The one area that is different is the way that dynamic labels are handled. In Pro, we use the Matplex labeling engine for label placement. We don't have the Matplex labeling engine inside of the runtime because <clears throat> it doesn't give us the performance on mobile devices that is acceptable. So we have a specific labeling engine that's been developed uh, from the ground up in runtime. It tries to support as much or as many of the properties that are available in Matplex as possible, but there are some subtle, subtle differences. If you're, uh, or the, if you're uh, uh, really uh, requiring exact label placement, my recommendation uh, once we ship update five is to not use the dynamic labeling engine, but to use annotation. Update five of runtime will fully support the new annotation model that's available in Pro. <clears throat> and that way your text will appear exactly the same in runtime as it did inside of Pro. So this was the code that uh, Nick showed there. You've got your mobile map package. You give it the path on your device to the mobile map package. <clears throat> then you tell the mo mobile map package to load. <clears throat> and at that point, you can get access to the array of maps contained inside of it. And uh, you can just ask for the first one if it's only got, uh, if you're only interested in the first one or, or it's only got one inside of it. <clears throat> so that's the desktop to device workflow. Now let's look at uh, the two more flexible <coughs> workflows and this is this occasionally connected uh, scenario. So when you're occasionally connected, your data is being backed by services. So if you're being backed by services, then uh, <clears throat> there are two workflows that we support, on-demand and pre-planned. And uh, you can use these workflows for read-only work or you can use them for editing work. And uh, we have a, a number of users, a number of organizations that are doing, doing both or doing one or the other. Uh, for instance, there's a, a large utility company uh, based up in uh, Northern California. They, do the, they use pre-planned, but they only use it for read-only maps because they want their field crews every day to go out with the most up-to-date map on their devices. And they have about 15,000 uh, uh, devices that get updated every day with new uh, map, uh, offline map areas before their fuel crews, before their fuel crews go out in the field. <clears throat> so we, but it's editing or read only. The work we're going to talk about here will apply to both. And uh, so, so this is relevant to the session that we did yesterday because it's more about the data preparation. So the data types that we support, vector tiles, raster tiles, features, tables that are often maybe connected through related uh, uh, records to features, and feature collections that uh, you can have within your web map or uh, referenced uh, separately from your web map. So the first thing you need to do, you actually need to enable the services to be able to go offline. By default, when you publish a service, a feature service or a tiled service, it will not be enabled for offline use. This is something that you as an administrator of your service have to turn on to allow that service to be taken offline. <clears throat> once, you've, uh, you, once you've done that, if it's a feature service, there's more settings that you can control whether you allow users to actually edit that content uh, when they're offline and the, the editing control is, is fairly fine, fine grained that you, can, that you can use. 
Okay, so let's have a look at the on-demand workflow. This is a very flexible workflow. You start by having your map that you've authored in the portal, and then you use it in your runtime application. And at this point, you're using it in a connected scenario. So that was the very first example that we saw this morning. But when you want to go offline, out in the field, the user in the field determines the parameters for the offline map uh, creation. What's the, the area that can go offline? What's the level of details that I need to, be, to support my work when I go offline? There's a number of parameters that you can expose to your users uh, when they decide to take that map offline. Or you could decide to simplify it and just allow them to pick the area that they want to go offline with. At that point, that information is sent up to the server. The server takes that and prepares a package, a mobile map package, ready to go offline. Once that's done, the client's notified that the package has been prepared, and then the client will download it onto their device. And this package is different from the package that gets created in Pro. This one supports editing, if your service supports editing. So the parameters that you can uh, work with as a developer and uh, optionally expose to your end users, the area that you want to go offline, the minimum and maximum scales, this is relevant for the base maps. It will tell uh, the, the system which LODs to uh, take the data from. Uh, you can say whether you want a base map or not. Maybe you've already got a base map on your device because they don't change very often. You might sideload a base map maybe once every six months onto your devices. So all that you want to do is to take the operational layers offline. <coughs> you can decide whether you want attachments or not. Uh, you can specify a definition expression to further reduce the content that's coming offline. And you can decide whether you want related uh, tables uh, or not. On an, that's on the package as a whole. And then on individual layers, you can specify uh, there's more control on the features that you're going to take offline on feature layers. And with tiles and vector tiles, there's some layer uh, settings that you can specifically set uh, uh, on your uh, offline map. They're, more, they're getting more advanced in their settings. Okay, so here's another demonstration from Nick. So let's take a look at the on-demand workflow. The on-demand workflow and the pre-planned workflow, for that matter, both begin with a web map. Whether you author that web map in ArcGIS Online or Enterprise, or in Pro and publish it up, the web map is central. So here we have a web map with a few layers in it. We jump over to the settings, and take a look at the offline settings, and see that there's this Enable Offline Mode checkbox. If that's on, you can take your web map offline as a whole. You may need to make sure that individual layers are also enabled for offline mode, but by and large, you should be good to go. So let's take a look at what taking this web map offline looks like from an iPad. Here we've got that same web map, and I'm going to navigate around. We're currently looking at the online version of it. I'm just going to take a portion of it offline. Now, Runtime is talking to the server at this point, to RGS Online or RGS Enterprise and kicking off a number of jobs on the server side to generate the components that runtime needs to be able to use this map offline. Here we're pulling together some base maps and some feature services in the form of uh, offline geodatabases. And we'll pull those down to the device and use them to display the data. Now in addition, ArcGIS Online and Enterprise will pull together metadata about the map, information about layer visibility scales, pop-up overrides, bookmarks and so on. And that gets pulled down as well and all hydrated and used together by the runtime to create full offline map experience. So it looks like right here we've got the geodatabase down already, we're just waiting for these vector tiles to finish generating and downloading. Once that's happened, we see the download happens really quickly and we have a fully interactive offline map. Now what you've noticed here is that some of the features extend beyond the extent of the base map that we were interested in. That's because by default, the map will get complete features down. We don't clip anything. That's important if you're doing editing. So 
The offline map task allows us to override segments for specific layers if we need to. So what we can also do is get rid of this. And we can pull this down with a larger base map area. So again, this is kicking off a set, similar kind of process as before. In fact, it's exactly the same process, but the parameters for the base map only have been overridden to get a much larger area. We'll look at that code in a bit and compare the code with the overrides and the code without the overrides. So we've seen we've got the geodatabase already. We're just, again, waiting for those vector tiles to be generated. Okay, so now you can see that's the extent of the features that we were interested in. But you can see some of them extend way beyond that. Only this time we managed to get a base map that's larger and can cover the area. So what's happening in code here when we do this? So we begin by opening a web map in the, in the application. We do that a lot like we did for working with an online map. Give it a portal ID, portal, and we create a map from it. Again, we're opening that in the map view, but we're also, in this case, creating an offline map task based off that online map. Then when we click the download button, we generate an area of interest that we want to get. That was at, uh, on the iPad that was shown as the red outline. We take the offline task and we generate a set of default parameters considering that area of interest. Once we get that back, we can just say download the on-demand area using the offline task with those parameters. We can specify a location on the local device where we want to keep that offline map. That kicks off this download on demand area function here. We're just going to set up some UI for the progress bars. And we're going to create a job. Here we take the offline task again. We say generate an offline map job using those parameters to download to that download location. We're going to hook up some progress bar uh, observation stuff to keep the progress bar up to date. And then we just start the job. Now there's a status handler, and here's where we add all those little messages to show what's happening on, uh, on the server side. But the key bit here is the completion handler. When that comes back, we get an offline result, and we're just going to close that download panel. What we do with the offline result is it ends up in here, we just take that map view that we had, we take the offline map out of that result. So the result being passed in here is just in here, we just take the offline map over there and show it in the map. That was the first demo where we got the uh, base maps clipped to the area of interest. But if we wanted to override the um, area of interest a little bit, we just added a little bit of code here. So in this case, we're going to call an override to this function with a buffer amount, and that's described here. So all we do that's different is we generate offline map parameter overrides given the parameters. So we begin, as before, by generating parameters considering the area of interest using the offline task. And then we say, OK, now we've got those parameters. I'd like to override some of them. So please give me a set of overrides that I can modify. And what that comes back with is a really fine-grained set of parameters that will be used to take that whole map offline base map layers, operational layers, and so on. And we can go in and we can tweak any one of those settings that we need to. In this case, we want to tweak the setting for the base map layer. So we look at the online map, and we just get the first base map layer in it. And we also can calculate a buffered area of interest. So we have that initial area of interest that defines how the features are being clipped. We actually want to buffer by a bit more. So we get an override key by providing a base map. And we say for that override key, we want to update the area of interest to this modified buffered large area of interest. So this bit of code here is just saying for the base map layer, get a larger area. And then we just jump back into the code that we had before. And the only difference is that when we create a job, we use a different generate offline map job call that also accepts these overrides. So we have the default parameters that we, we had before. We also have the per layer overrides that we tweaked, and it comes down to the same download location, and everything else is exactly the same. 
We get the same kind of joke back. We hook it up to the UI the same way. We execute it the same way. And when we get the result back, we drop that into the map view exactly the same way. So that was getting a web map offline using its default settings for a given area of interest. And then taking a look at how you override individual settings for the context of that web map if you need to tweak or change it. All right. So the code that Nick was showing, this is it in kind of simpler form. It introduces uh, this concept of a task and a job. And tasks are used extensively in runtime, especially when communicating with servers where the work is being done elsewhere. And uh, if you're executing uh, geoprocessing tools on the server, you do that th through, through tasks. And the idea with the task, they all follow the same pattern. You create the task, you load it, and that allows the task to communicate with the server and find out information about the task that's going to be performed and provide sensible defaults. So the, the task knows its sensible defaults, but if you want, you can override these and you can go and ask the task for its parameters and you can uh, start to override some of these parameters uh, uh, the, or override the defaults. And then you call a job, you, s you start a job using the, the task, and then the job you start, you monitor the progress of the job, and when it's completed, you check the results and, and work with the results of the job. So it's a very common programming pattern that you see all, uh, all over the runtime. And this is it using these more advanced overrides. The setup is exactly the same thing, but this time you're asking for the parameter overrides and you get these, uh, uh, you get a dictionary of potential overrides uh, which you can then uh, uh, work with. Definitely more advanced in the workflows, uh, but uh, it, it can be very flexible and it does provide quite a bit of control over uh, the user experience that you can provide. So again, you've got to think about how your users are going to be working offline and if you can simplify their experience or streamline the workflow by overriding some of the defaults, then uh, go ahead and, and do that. So here we have it in a flow diagram. You've got your map. From the map, you create your offline map task. You can get the parameters and customize them if you want. For more advanced, you can get the overrides to these parameters and customize them. You fire off the map job and you end up with an offline map. So that's the on-demand workflow. It's very flexible for your field crews because they decide exactly the area that they want. So if you're not able to predict where people are going to be, then this is a workflow that, that works. But as you saw, there's a lot of work that has to happen on the server every single time a request comes in. All that data has got to be prepared. All the tiles have got to be pulled out of the large tile stores and staged. And then the download happens very quickly. So there's a, a scaling issue that you need to be aware of. If you have people going out into the field uh, and maybe you're supporting 10 or 20, 30 people going out in the field uh, uh, at the start of the day, the, the uh, uh, on-demand works quite nicely. But as you get higher in numbers and they're all going offline at the same time, it puts a lot of strain on your server capacity because the server is having to respond to all of these requests and it's all, always accessing data into the, uh, back in the database and it's, if you like, creating an individual copy for every single user that wants to go offline. So we have, uh, we have an issue. And so to support a more scalable workflow, we have pre-planned. And this scales to thousands, tens of thousands of users all going offline at the same time. So the idea behind pre-planned is you specify a number of areas in your web map. Currently, we're restricted to 16. Uh, it's kind of arbitrary. Uh, we're thinking about raising that, uh, raising that number. If you need to support more than 16 areas today, you'll need to model that with multiple web maps. And you might have a, 
uh, four web maps for regions and within each region you might have 16 areas that you could take offline but you can that's how you would do that today but you have your area the area is a portal item and the area ultimately maps to a map package that the portal is responsible for creating and so the portal has your TPKs, your uh, VTPKs, your geodatabases. They're all created inside of that map package. And these areas are managed by the portal. And as I say, you can have any number up to 16. And then after that, you need to model it with multiple, multiple maps. And these areas are created when you create the map area. The map package gets created. But you can also set an automated, automatic update time. And... Uh, Typically, we see this sometime during the night when people are not going offline uh, or there's no real users using it. All the areas get recreated uh, through the night and so they're all ready uh, uh, with the most up-to-date information for when field crews go out into the field uh, in the morning. So here we have the uh, pre-planned workflow. The uh, uh, map gets authored. And of course, we can, con we can connect to that map in a connected mode. That still works with the runtime application. But if we want to go disconnected, there's more work to be done on the back end. We've got to generate these mobile map uh, packages, these pre-planned areas, and there's a user experience for doing that. Uh, or you can use the Python API or just uh, raw REST requests if you want to automate it on, on using some other mechanism. Once these pre-packaged areas are created, the runtime application comes along and gets to, connects to the web map. It, it'll see it's got pre-planned areas available and it, it, you can present a list to your user and they can choose which area they would like to take offline and then it just downloads the web resource. So it's a very fast uh, operation. It's as quick as their internet connection is. There's no work being done on the server at download time other than serving out a web resource. Okay, here's uh, Nick again. I want to take a quick look at a couple of aspects of working with the pre-planned workflow. Here we are looking at the familiar web map again. And I'm going to jump into this uh, description page. If we go into the settings here, take a look at offline. And you can see, okay, we've got offline mode enabled again as before. We can see there are five map areas to find. So let's take a look at what that means. Click this button, up pops the map and manage areas interface. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here so you can see, okay, we've got that same context, here's the same data, we just have to be able to scale rate at that point. But we've got these five areas we've already defined. We can hover over them, we can take a look at one of them. Let's take a look at this Columbia States area. See there's some little hints and tips there which we can dismiss. Uh, we've got some information about this area. How often does it update and when? When's the next update scheduled? So as data is changed in the map area, OGIS Online or Enterprise will go ahead and repackage that on this interval. We could edit this, uh, delete it. Let's go ahead and create a new area. We'll do that and draw an area right up here. Let's call this Windscape villages. Say how much detail we want on the maps. And we've got a vector tile based map here, so we can zoom all the way in without worrying about generating too many tiles necessarily. Every week? Sure, every week. Let's do every day. Again, five. Okay. And we'll save this. So now it's created that additional area for us. As you packaging it up initially, we'll do that the first time you create it. It's going to create that initial package, and then it will revert back to the schedule. So, let's look at that running on an iPad. Here I've got pre-planned applications pointing at that web map. You can see it's already picked up that Windscape Villages option. Now, I'm not going to load that because it's still packaging right now. We can go ahead and use one of the other ones, like Columbia State. Tap on that, download it, it comes down over the wire really quickly, and we end up with this 
and it's really interesting to have the respective time place maps sitting behind our operational data. And as we've talked about, we can edit this, we can synchronize this back. Um, but let's take a look at what code was involved there. If I switch over to Xcode, first thing to think about is connecting to that map. So, um, as we saw with the on demand, it's pretty straightforward. It's very much like just showing the map in the display. In this case, we're not even going to bother putting that map into a map view. We're just going to create an offline map task based off that map, just as before. Now, when we display that user interface to list out the areas, here's what happens. I'm passing in the offline map task. And I'm just calling get pre-planned areas. When I've got them back, I've got a array that I'm holding on to of areas, and I just set it to the results that I got back from calling get pre-planned map areas up here. That triggers a user interface update, um, and we're not going to look at in this bit of code. Um, the key bit, really, is when someone picks one of those areas, what happens. So let's take a look here. Here we've got an area that was selected from that user interface that came out of this array of areas up here. We've got that same offline map task again. And we've figured out the location we want to download that to on the device. We have control of that, so you as a developer can know where these things are being downloaded to. Using that offline map task, we, we call download pre planned offline map job and get a job back. Now, with the on demand workflow, we specified a few things here. We just specify the area and that download directory. We add that observer again to watch the progress and keep the status bar updated. And then we just kick off the job. We call start. We get this status handler that gets updated whenever there's a new message to display or the job status has changed. Um, and then we have a completion handler, which is called just once at the end when all the data is being downloaded. It's ready to open. So here we've got the result. We can set that result. And then what we do is we hide ourselves and show the map view. So we've got this result from the completion handler stored away. And very simply, back here in the map view, once we've hidden all the user interface and returned to the map view, we've got that AGS download pre-planned offline map result. That's this thing up here. And we just say result.offline map, get that, and associate it, show it in the map view. And the map views map that offline map we got back. And that's all it took to list the areas, download a specific area, and display the map representing that area in the runtime. Okay. So, what happens if your data is updating on the server constantly? How do you ensure that you get the latest? set of data. If Nick, in his example, was updating the map at 5 a.m., but maybe edits have already been pushed into the database and your field crews need to get the most up-to-date information. Well, that's easily achieved with this workflow. You would download the pre-planned area, which is 5 a.m. status. The very first thing your application should do after the download is to perform a sync. You've got no edits to upload, but it will download anything that's happened on the server since that package was created at 5 a.m. And that way you will be guaranteed to have the most up-to-date map on your uh, device. So it's good practice <clears throat> to always, if you're working in the, where the data is changing, it's always good practice once you've downloaded it to perform a sync. If there's nothing happening on the server, the sync will happen very, very quickly. If lots of activities happen on the server, it'll take a little bit longer because it's having to download that activity to the device, but you will have the most up-to-date information inside your application. <coughs> so the, uh, the, the code that Nick went through there, again, starting with the offline map task, initialized with the web map, they find out the map areas that are available you can use these map areas in a user experience because you get a thumbnail and a description about uh, the map area. You can then allow the user to select which one they're interested in, <clears throat> and then you download that using the uh, uh, download pre-planned map areas. That returns a job. You monitor the job, and when, when it's complete, you use the result of that as the map. So here we have it in the flow diagram. It's a little bit simpler than the uh, Oops, in the pre-planned, you start with your offline map task, you allow the user to pick the map area, and then you download it. Very straightforward. Okay, so in summary, uh, 
we would recommend the pre-planned workflow if you know your users are going to be going to predefined areas to do their work. That creation of the areas can be very dynamic. You, you may, it may be quite static. It may be specific uh, regions that your field crews always go into, in which case it's easy to define the, pre, uh, the pre-planned area. Or it might be dependent on the work orders that that field crew or these field crews are going to satisfy that day. In which case, you could write Python code to automate the creation. So every day, you might decide at the end of the day, at midnight, your Python code gets executed. It'll delete all the previous pre-planned areas that the system had for the previous day. It'll look at the work order information, figure out where these areas are, and recreate them overnight. That could be uh, done and automated quite nicely with the Python API. The field crews come in in the morning, they pick the area that they're interested in, and then they go offline. On demand, use that one if you're not really sh sure at all where your uh, workers are going to be or uh, events are going to be taking place. But think about the load on the server. If you need to support more and more users with the on-demand, you may need to have uh, more powerful servers to do the, uh, 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 the, the data creation that's backing that on-demand workflow. Try and adopt, if you've, if you've not already adopted WebGIS, try and adopt the WebGIS pattern because it is going to provide you the most flexibility. The, uh, these patterns that are backed by services support on-demand and pre-planned they definitely are the most flexible for your offline workflows. Uh, but if you can't use the uh, WebGIS pattern, we still have uh, the uh, uh, side loading the data that's been authored inside of ArcGIS Pro. That is, that is an option. Uh, always think about the connectivity that your uh, users are going to have when they're using your application and design with that in mind when you're starting your uh, design for your application. And that also includes thinking about the data workflows that you want to be able to support. It's not just about the user experience. And uh, we often see hybrid approaches working very well. And what do I mean by hybrid? I mean, some data might be sideloaded onto the device. Base maps is a classic that we see all the time. Base map data gets created inside of Pro as a, as a map package, it's read-only. It gets sideloaded onto the device because it doesn't change very often. And it's only the dynamic content, the content in your operational layers, that's downloaded on a daily basis. And that reduces the size of download significantly. Okay, so that's all I had. Uh, please don't forget to uh, fill out the survey and uh, uh, let uh, uh, let us know what you thought of uh, Nick's demos and, and my, my slides and talking. And we've got some time for questions. Questions? Yes, a question here. Uh, 16, that's an RGS online restriction as far as the 16 packages. The, the question on the uh, pre-planned with 16 map, map areas, that's an RGS online and RGS enterprise restriction. But we're we're thinking about raising it to, to a higher number because we've heard from a number of users that 16 doesn't quite, uh, doesn't quite cut it. And it's, it, it, there's no technical reason why it's 16. It's, it was kind of arbitrary. Okay, just kind of a feature request, I guess. In the, with the offline packages, you can't unregister them. You know, so those replicas sit on the server. Which need you know, tidied up. Do it manually or right. write custom code to go into that folder and unregister those geodata. Yeah, there, there's, there is a call in the API that you can call to unregister the right. database. Right, but it's, but it's not. It's not in that offline. But mapping. it's not in that offline mapping. Mm -hmm. So that higher level workflow, no. Yeah. So you, you, you're basically asking for that call yeah. to be a bit higher up. Okay. Take that on. Any other questions? No other questions. So yes, we've got one up here. The area of interest is that. Good question. The area of interest, does it have to be a rectangle or a square or can it be any arbitrary polygon? With update four and before, it, had to, it has to be a rectangle. 
With update 5, which is coming out in three weeks, two weeks, it can be a polygon. So if you're, if you're taking an area offline and say it's on, a, it's on a road network and all you want to do is take the tiles and the data that are buffered along the road, you can pass in a buffered, that buffered road polygon and it will just take the tiles offline required to support that road network. That's an update 5 enhancement. Add on to that, can you base it off like, a, like district boundaries? The, 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 uh, the question was, can you, can you base that uh, polygon to take offline, uh, can you base it on uh, other data? Yes, it's up to you to, to make the query into the source data and then construct the geometry, buffer, the, buffer, buffer it for instance, and pass that in as the, uh, as the area of interest. Another question here? Are there size limitations? Good question. Are there size limitations to how much you take offline? It's kind of yes and no. Uh, in theory, there is no size limitation, but the server user can restrict the amount of data that can be taken offline. So for instance, the, uh, the base map tiles from ArcGIS Online, we restrict it to 15,000 tiles that you can take offline uh, because we don't want people taking our entire tile cache collection offline. Uh, plus, the size of a package of 15,000 raster tiles starts to get quite large. So it, again, it's arbitrary, as if you're running on your own server infrastructure, you could leave it unlimited, but you've got to think about the user experience. If they're downloading gigabytes of data onto their device, you're probably going to get a few phone calls. So it's, it is, it's, it's limited, but it's limited by the server administrator. Question at the back? Yeah, is there any way to um, get around the 16 and 5 um, if you generate a case and sideload it to your device, but have running on the server and generate it and store it there? OK, so I think the question was, is there any way to get around that 16 map area limit? Is that the question? Yeah, I mean, yeah. instead of using online Okay, so there's, I'll answer it in two, two, two parts. Is there a way to get around the 16 limit uh, 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 predefined areas for a, for a web map? There is, there's no hard, there's no easy way to get around that. You can model your problem with multiple web maps. And you could, as I said before, you could have a country, uh, but you could have a web map for each region of the country, and within each region, you could have 16 areas that could go offline, as an example. And that would be modeled with two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight web maps. So that's, that's one way uh, to, to do that. The, the, uh, the other thing you talked about was, well, could I automate the process with, uh, with Pro or maybe geoprocessing to create multiple uh, packages? You can automate the creation of packages with Pro, and you could use uh, uh, ArcPy to do that, but they're creating read-only packages for you, remember. Yeah, that's the issue. And uh, if you're needing to create read-write and you're wanting to be editing your data, then you've got to use the tools inside of uh, uh, the enterprise, the pre-planned tools and the Python API. So I think until we raise the limit of 16, your option would be to model it with multiple web maps. Okay, I think uh, that's it. Thank you very much for attending.